Good afternoon and welcome to this panel on American alliances and partnerships here at the Reagan National Defense Forum. When I accepted this invitation, they did not say that it would be happening literally in the shadow of a decommissioned Air Force One, but I guess that's appropriate. Um, what more globally recognized symbol of American power and also a conveyance for getting American leaders to important summits and gatherings. It seems like an appropriate symbol for this uh, collection of people. Uh, please remember to submit any and all questions you have for this panel via the RNDF app. I can vouch for the fact that it works. I submitted a question earlier today. Uh, with that, let's, uh, let's get to know this uh, distinguished panel. Senator Lindsey Graham, Republican of South Carolina. Yes, sir. Antti Kaikkonen, Minister of Defense for Finland. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Dr. Alexander Karp, co-founder of Palantir Technologies. Minister Ng, uh, Minister of Defense for Singapore. And General mm -hmm. Laura Richardson, commander of the US Southern Command. <clears throat> all right, as we gather here today, uh, I don't, probably don't need to make a, a laundry list of all the different ways that American partnerships, alliances, and relations are being strained. You know, the obvious one, uh, Russia's expanded war in Ukraine, China's designs on Taiwan, um, the uh, perennial challenges, Iran, North Korea, uh, the situation with, uh, with the, the climate crisis, um, China testing us another way by, uh, by seeking influence across the globe, in, notably in Latin America. Um, there are a lot of questions now about the future of alliances and partnerships, and um, over all of it looms a, a sense uh, in some quarters of engagement fatigue, uh, a, a domestic political consideration that, I, that I'm actually going to start with. Um, Senator Graham, you're the only person on this panel who is directly accountable to American voters. Well, I guess that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, since, you don't want to take anything too far. Once every six years is enough. <laughs> yeah. um, well, but so since the George W. Bush era, I've heard from a number of American allies and partners that they're worried about what they sometimes refer to as our, our staying power um, in terms of these inter international commitments, international relationships. Um, we've seen, of course, the public opinion polling that shows that more and more Republicans are skeptical of aid to Ukraine. Yeah. When it comes to that dynamic, is the system blinking red or is this sort of business as usual? What's your general sense of that? Well, I think it's kind of business as usual. There's alliances uh, before and after Trump. There's alliances before and after Afghanistan. So <clears throat> what did Trump do? He said NATO should pay more. All of our people like that. So if you're going to have an alliance, you've got to prove to Americans going forward there's value in the alliance for you that you're not the only one fighting and dying, you're not the only one spending money. So <clears throat> the Republican Party will hold on Ukraine. Kevin McCarthy is going to be, hopefully he gets to be speaker. But I think you'll find bills to make the aid more transparent, account for the weapons. You'll be f finding efforts by me and others to get Germany and other allies to do more, because it's easier for me to go back home and say, listen, <clears throat> if you don't think Ukraine's important, you're missing the boat because China is watching everything we do and Taiwan's really important because all the chips in the world pretty much are in Taiwan and we need to change that. So the idea of burden sharing, Trump has bought to the table. America first, I think, is other people should do more. We should not go it alone. Isolationism is fool's gold. It is fake security. I'm in the, uh, you know, internationalist wing of the party. We're going to be fine, but we're going to have to understand that the public, not just Republicans, are, are asking us questions. All this money we're spending and everything, can we get other people to do more and are we getting a good bang for a buck? And I think those questions uh, should be asked and we should have a better answer. Yeah, I could go back to Obama era quotes about NATO burden sharing that if I read them Sam blind. Nunn. If I read them blind, right, Sam Nunn, if I read them blind and asked you who it was, you might guess Donald Trump. Yeah, and, and that's right. Just out of curiosity, do you, do you in fact have voters come up and say what, of what value is aid to Ukraine, of what value is the NATO partnership? Yeah, I mean, I do town halls and number one, I said, if you're coming to my town hall, there's two things we have in common. And you have no life, I have no life. You know, who goes to a town hall? So, <clears throat> but I start with the idea of national security is the number one thing we should do in Congress. And I'll do this really quick. Of all the jobs, we have as Congress is to defend the nation as something states can't do. I asked the question, how many believe that if the radical Islamists could find a way to kill three million of us, they would? Everybody raises their hand. How many of you believe if uh, we don't keep our eye on them over there, they're coming here? 
How many of you believe it's better to do it with partners than by yourself? I talk about Ukraine. How many people believe Putin will stop at the Ukraine? How many people believe that if China takes Taiwan, the world begins to deteriorate? And most people buy into the idea that you don't want to set the conditions for another World War II in Europe. You got to walk them through. Nobody's dying in Ukraine. How many people believe it's nice to have an ally willing to do all the fighting? So you walk them through, the consequences of doing nothing and the consequences of giving money, it's not even close in my view, and I end on Taiwan. How many of you would go to war for Taiwan? And everybody looks at me really hard and concerned. So I would say this, the Taiwan Relations Act is a piece of legislation by Bob Menendez and myself that would give Taiwan major non-NATO ally status, and it would increase foreign military sales to the Taiwanese to make it more like a porcupine. So we're finding a lot of resistance. When I talk to people back home, they actually buy into the idea that if you let China get away with taking Taiwan, it changes our economy, uh, chips are the oil of the future, and it would be dumb to let a communist dictatorship dominate the 21st century. Thank you. Uh, Minister Kukakun, and let's talk about one of the biggest changes to allies and partnerships uh, in, in, well, not quite a generation, the, the expansion, NATO expansion. Uh, fin Finland will, uh, barring, well, has to overcome a few hurdles, but you will be joining NATO. My question to you is, uh, how has the experience of being an American partner changed since that decision was made? Day to day, how, how, have your relationships with American counterparts changed? Uh, and I've, I've got to follow up as well. The relationship to, to U.S. Between, between Finland and the United States, already had a partnership, already yeah. had yeah. military to military connections. Has it, well, I should say, I mean, I'll ask it differently. Has it changed? Well, it has deepened, deepened, and it will deepen even more when we become the member of, of, of NATO. And I have to say the strong support from U.S. has been of utmost importance for, for us during this NATO, NATO process. So thank you. Thank you all for, for, for that. That has been very important for Finland and Sweden, Sweden as well. When the security situation so dramatically changed in February, quite soon we decided that we have to do the conclusions now. Uh, we've been a close partner to NATO for, for decades, but uh, now it was time to, to take a new, new step and, and, and then be a part of the, of the family. And the ratification process has gone really well. We have 28 out of 30 NATO countries ratified. Two is missing, Hungary and Turkey, and hopefully we'll get those, those soon also. But uh, I have to say the cooperation with you has been uh, excellent and uh, with both, both parties also. And it, it's, it's great that the support for our membership, membership in NATO and the security of Northern Europe has been so important to you. So thank you for that. I know that there are some sensitivities with this, with this next question, but it seems to me that the, the moment of danger for Finland is between now and actual ratification, because once ratification happens, then you have the Article 5 mutual defense umbrella, but Russia might be tempted to do something before that. Have you received any kind of assurances from the United States um, or, or any, any U.S. demarches to Russia to warn them off that kind of adventurism? Well, I'd say... The messages we've got from the U.S. That is that the, the security of Finland and Sweden is important for U.S. already already now and the whole NATO and it's the message from NATO also 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 so uh, and for example the United Kingdom has been also very active in some other other major uh, NATO countries and we've uh, had more military exercises with U.S. and more military presence during this uh, ratification process and it has been also also imp important. But actually, yes, we do have a long borderline with Russia, but uh, it's calm and peaceful in the, in the border. So clearly, Russia's military focus is in Ukraine at the moment. So we don't feel that there is any immediate military threat from, from, from Russia. But we want to look in a longer perspective, and we believe that, that that decision to join NATO is good for us. But actually, we have a capable military forces, and we believe that Joining NATO is good for NATO, NATO as well. So it's a win-win situation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Karp, love your thoughts on this moment in, in public sector, private sector cooperation. I, I feel like I, following the war in Ukraine, uh, if I open up my newspaper, I see satellite images produced by a private sector firm. Um, 
when I, uh, when I read about communications in Ukraine, I see private uh, firms coming in and shouldering a lot of the burden. How has this conflict, if it has, transformed that relationship? Well, um, you know, I think this is a, I, I'm a reformed philosopher, and um, which you know, I won't bore you with the academic, but the, before um, February 24th, um, I think the narrative among our adversaries, and certainly even among some of our allies, and you know, when I've talked to them, a lot of our business outside of America, was something like, uh, well, you in America, you love liberty, uh, you produce great films, but in fact, the adversaries are as good as you are on military, uh, and they're willing to do things you're not. And I think the February 24th and what's happened in the Ukraine, uh, involving technology in ways we can some can't really talk about always in public, has changed the narrative around war and America to it's the liberty-loving, tech-building tech, tech people of the West, especially of America, who produce products that are so superior that the non-freedom-loving people need to shiver a little more than they have in the past. And this is crucial for the West and, our, and, and all of our allies who primarily love the freedoms and liberties we have to show the, our adversaries that, in fact, we are superior at modern warfare, which I would define as tech-enhanced kinetic uh, attack weapons. So software-enhanced, the software, the fact that software is eating the world is horrifically important for businesses. We, most of our businesses in the private sector, but it's particularly advantageous for America because America is the best at building software. And uh, the fact that we can build weapons, software-enhanced weapons that really make our adversaries quiver as Senator Graham said more in a more articulate way than, than I could, that prevents war. And now, what does that mean for the tech sector? You know, you're seeing a lot of tech companies who once thought the way to support the US military was to first hand technology to our adversaries and then, and this has shifted. There's more of a unity of we are going to support the US government, not just crazy Palantir and their crazy batshit crazy CEO. It's like, we are going to support the US government. And this, this is crucial. It's like we have the resources in this country. We often have not used them to support our war fighters. And that, that's changed, and in great part, because our adversaries are clearly just worthy of getting kicked in the fanny. <laughs> a technical term. Yeah. Uh, Minister Ng, you've got a front row seat to American competition uh, with China. We hear a lot of uh, chest thumping rhetoric out of the United States. We're doing great in corral, getting all these allies and partners together to counterbalance China. Um, what could we be doing better? Um, that's a great question. Yeah, but, but in order to understand uh, reactions towards, let's say, ASEAN members, towards the US-China rivalry, there's a historical context. If I, it's useful to compare US acceptance in our region uh, historically, and if you take a reference point, uh, President J.F. Uh, Kennedy's inauguration speech that one form of tyranny should not be replaced by another, and he was, of course, referring to communism. And even for that acceptance of the U.S. presence in ASEAN, or Indo-Pacific, or in Asia, it wasn't a given acceptance. You had problems in Vietnam, Indochina, and remember in the 1960s, there was quite an uh, odium and opprobrium because of the Vietnam War. Singapore, uh, and we have to give credit to Mr. Lee, as, as in a lot of the decisions, decided very early on that uh, we and the Singapore government would support US presence in ASEAN. And even when uh, difficult periods of the Vietnam War, we openly stated that we believe that the US presence was a stabilizing force. We, uh, one, one of the first acts was to allow US soldiers to do their r and and these would be posted in Vietnam to do it in Singapore. And in 1967, uh, when there was questions about US presence in our region, Mr. Lee made it clear that the US presence was important. Now, remember this was before U.S. as post-World War II victors were, and its Western allies were creating a global system, whether it was the post <clears throat> Bretton Woods, IMF, uh, WTO, uh, finance and trade. And 
1990, when uh, they had issues with Subic and Clark, we stepped in, Singapore stepped in and offered the presence of our air bases and uh, uh, naval bases for US airmen and uh, assets to rotate through as they are today. So 1990, an MOU was signed. It was recently renewed in 2015 between President Trump and my prime minister, which extended it. So today, uh, your ships and planes go through Singapore. So um, you asked the question, what you could be doing better? And I'm replying that the legitimacy of the US presence in our region was never a given. It was predicated on, yes, one security, but never solely on security. And it was the US building this global system, which ASEAN countries, China itself, emerging economies benefited from that globalized system. Now, uh, in counterterrorism, similarly, we supported the US. We were in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it wasn't as if ASEAN countries fully supported your missions in Afghanistan and Iraq. Malaysia and Indonesia are Islamic countries, and they protested that war. We come to the present situation, and we ask ourselves, what's different? And what is different now, I think American security and military presence in the Indo-Pacific region, we support it. We support your rebalancing. We, uh, we will support the greater presence of US ships and planes through Singapore. The question is, is that enough? Because on the other hand, uh, on the other side, of the economic side, there is a perception that US is against multilateralism, that the US has withdrawn as it did from TPP, and then the, the other partners went on to the comprehensive TPP. Uh, at the same time, uh, very much China dominated regional cooperation agreement for Asian countries, which together is 2.2 trillion, uh, was signed. And I think that's the issue. To situate American presence in Asia solely on Taiwan, it's a slightly more difficult proposition. It is not communism. You have a one-China policy, which many of us have one-China policy. And the reason why all our one-China policies are quite ambiguous is because you know, that's why you need three communiques and six assurances and what more. Is there is a reason for it, but globally, there is a one-China policy in the UN. So I would exercise some caution with that. And let me answer your question. I think uh, the US increasing their military presence in Asia as a stabilizing force is virtuous, is good. We will support that. We think that the US should do more to engage, as it did previously, to build an economic framework, which, as a tide, it can lift all boats, and be careful on Taiwan. So let me follow up on that. You know, we have, when we talk about alliances and partnerships, we could talk about bilateral relationships. We could talk about formal alliances, like a NATO. Uh, we could talk about less formal, but still important, uh, alliances like the Quad. Uh, is the United States doing enough through uh, existing multilateral fora. It sounds like you're saying we're not really doing enough through multilateral fora. Um, and would, it, would this relationship benefit from adding some uh, additional structure to formalize these relationships? Uh, to you, Minister Yang, I'm sorry. I think you're doing quite a lot in the military front, the Quad, the AUKUS. And, uh, and despite the assurances this is not focused on any one country, I think the more initiated will uh, conclude otherwise, and that it is. And it's a response to certain aspects. And China will respond. Uh, China will respond as it had did after the 20th National Party Congress. It will respond as in the formation of the, the Central Military Commission, as it did. Uh, and some liken it to a war cabinet. 
I suppose there's some basis in that. But the question I'm posing, is American presence in the Indo-Pacific primarily premised on security grounds adequate? And will it give you that kind of moral legitimacy that you had from the 1960s uh, to the year 2000? General Richardson, you've got a front row seat in a, of a different sort. Uh, and I, I, I told you when we met that I'm a recovering Latin Americanist. I have a, a lot of questions, but for now, I will settle on this one. Uh, we hear a lot in, in the news media about China trying to buy influence via belt and road uh, spending. And I guess what I don't see as much is an explanation of what that means day to day for someone who's managing a lot of complicated relationships. When you walk into meetings, with leaders and military officials in Latin America. Have you ever heard someone say, well, we would, but China's building us the port? How, how does it shape the day-to-day -day relationship? I think uh, interesting in this, in this region and uh, the impacts that COVID has had uh, over the past couple of years, the impact, uh, 107 million people in this region uh, thrown into poverty and so they're trying to dig out of the hole of poverty because of the COVID impacts. And we see the residual impacts of what COVID has done into our uh, own nation. Uh, but they are, these are uh, democracies trying to deliver for their people. And they're having a hard time doing it and the people are impatient. And so um, as the, uh, you know, I try to encourage investment to create opportunities for these countries because they want to work with us. They want to be part of this, uh, I like to say the integrated deterrence. It really means a lot in terms of that term that uh, Secretary Austin uses. I like to say it's like being on team democracy. And it's everybody that wants to be on team democracy, come and be on the team. But you have to be on the field. You have to have your jersey on to be effective. And the thing is, is we can't just talk about it. We've got to get investment to this region because they need, they need help. And when uh, the PRC is the only one that's, uh, that's bidding on tenders when these countries put out bids for projects, these projects are uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Every project is, has a B behind it. It's not an M, it's a B for billion. Uh, in 2002, the PRC had put uh, 18 billion towards this region. In 2022, it is 450 billion. And then we're anticipating by 2030 that that's gonna to close to double. So we have got to get investment uh, from the United States, from the globe. Again, I run exercises, I have eight exercises per year and each one of them brings at least over 20 partner nations. I've got 31 countries, 16 dependencies in this region. And when over 20 partner nations come to participate in these exercises, it tells you we have the relationships, but it, these are relationships for, our, for us to lose if we aren't careful. And the way I look at it is the Western Hemisphere is security for our own homeland, for our own United States. Having a secure Western Hemisphere, it also secures the global supply chains. Uh, and uh, it, it would be wise that we put way more investment so close to our own homeland. I'd like to say uh, the Western Hemisphere is on the 20-yard line or in the red zone, if you want to use a football analogy. I can fly to 80% of this AOR from Miami, where my headquarters is, in two to three hours. That's how close. These, this is our shared neighborhood. These are our neighbors, and they mean a lot, and they want to work with us. So as a, as a Frenchman, it's my duty to squander any goodwill that I've generated with the audience um, with, with this question. And I want to stay with you, General, but I'd like to bring you in, Senator, as well. So a, uh, a hypothetical um, leader of a foreign country sees the Under Secretary of State arrive uh, on a commercial flight with one or two aides with them. And then they see uh, a Lieutenant General arrive in their own C-17 with 80 staffers. And the decision about whom to engage more seems to lean in the direction of the Pentagon. Uh, this is the premise, of course, of my colleague Dana Priest's book, The Mission, a long time ago, that the Pentagon over time, because of the resources that it gets, has taken over a bigger and bigger role of managing these bilateral ties. Um, I realize it's, it's, this is an awkward question given, given the setting, but uh, to both of you, and I guess I'll start with you, um, Senator Graham, 
do we need to rebalance that equation? Do we need to, and I'm not going to suggest cutting defense spending here, I'll be lynched, but, but in terms of but boosting, uh, uh, sure. I, I was going to say earlier that one of your most important foreign policy jobs was as the top Republican uh, managing the appropriations process on this stuff. So is it time to do some kind of rebalancing? Sure. So the entire foreign uh, 150 account that funds the State Department, all developmental aid, is about $58 billion. Compare that to the Defense Department's budget. I think uh, soft power is national security in another form. The Developmental Finance Corporation is a tool we're trying to create so we can show up in Latin America and other parts of the world, particularly Africa, and offer a better alternative to people on the ground than usurious loans coming from China full of corruption. They will actually do a deal with you where you can hire your own workers, not a bunch of Chinese. Half a life is showing up. In this space, we're woefully inadequate. We do not have the tools to show up and compete with China and Africa. Uh, Africa Command should have more civilian uh, impact. Uh, Carl Rove's out in the audience. Millennial Challenge Corporation was one of the best things that President Bush ever did. It gave us a chance to go and give bilateral aid with metrics so you could get some return on investment, you could see things move in the right direction. So I want more. The Global Fund has worked in the area of uh, AIDS and malaria. I want a Global Fund for food security where you get the private sector and uh, a coalition of the willing investing in Africa to make sure people don't have to move because they have no water to drink or they can't produce their own food. So this space is woefully inadequate. And uh, that's why people look to the Department of Defense. But let me tell you what's woefully inadequate. There's a bunch of happy talk at this place. It's beginning to piss me off. If you really are worried about China, which we all should be, how can you reduce the, the number of ships in the Navy over the next decade? The budget's being presented by the Biden administration and go to 2.3% of the GDP in year 10. We go down to 280 ships in the Navy from like 318. Everything we're talking about west of the international date line can't be done with the budgets we have. So if you're really serious about making China pay better attention, you better have an alternative to Guam, because that's the only place basically we can you know, refuel. Australia wants to do more. They want to make more weapons in Australia that we can all use, but it's too bureaucratic. So the bottom line here is that alliances are not being formed in Asia consistent with containing China and supporting democracy. And let's get back to Taiwan to my good friend from Singapore. I want to be in Asia. The TPP is dead on both sides. Clinton and uh, Trump both campaigned against the TPP. It was a mistake. We should have a multilateral partnership on the economic side in China's backyard, but we don't because the politics is not there. Everybody here is talking about we be, need to be tougher on China. The military budget is not consistent with the rhetoric. When it comes to containing China in Africa and other places, the developmental aid, the tools we have to show up to help her almost don't exist. So I would say that the strategy America has today on the economic front and on the military front to deal with expansionist China is woefully inadequate to the task. General, your thoughts on the civilian military balance when it comes to managing international relationships? So I would say that the challenges are so cross-cutting that it requires all of us. So I'll go back to team democracy again, integrated deterrence. It's our allies and partners. It's academia. It's NGOs. It's the industry, private sector. It's anybody that wants to be on team democracy. It requires all of us to work together. I'd like to highlight that in Southcom we have, as my civilian deputy, I've got a uh, former ambassador to El Salvador, Ambassador Gene Maines. And we have down and in with all of the ambassadors and charges that are uh, in our countries, as well as the, as the relationship with the Western Ham Bureau and the Department of State, uh, all of the other interagency folks that are really critical to get after all of the cross-cutting challenges. Uh, I don't know that it's, uh, I wouldn't say that it's a rebalancing. It requires all of us to work every day, hand in hand, getting after these challenges with our allies and partners. I think the common theme is more, more. Uh, At a time when American voters are not so sure. Yes, uh, Minister. I just wanted to jump in then, uh, uh, support what Senator Graham was saying, uh, both militarily and economically. I mean, militarily, we've talked about it. 
and that we would support more U.S. presence. But um, economically, just the one metric that we ought to understand that will shape the response to either this U.S.-China rivalry in, in, in Asia is that China now, for almost all Asian countries, is a top trading partner. Now, you're going, that's going to weigh very heavily on you, and it's not only Asia, and that's why you have the Prime Minister of Germany saying uncoupling is a bad idea, and you have the Netherlands saying, you know, it can't be done. And remember that for a lot of our transnational problems, yes, we can talk about friend, friendly shoring, onshoring, but if you just take a simple component of batteries to deal with climate change, you have uh, the precious metals that are needed are only located in a number of countries. You will need cooperation of countries, including China, to deal with many of them. So I think that economic aspect has, you have to do more, and I completely understand where Senator Graham was saying that the domestic politics didn't support it. Uh, I, I don't think we should prescribe form, but America needs to in your parlance, up its game in the economic sphere, whether it's in Asia or globally. Well, let's, let's uh, stay with that for a, for a second. And I want to bring in uh, Minister Kaklanen as well. Um, this week, French President Emmanuel Macron was in DC. And at the French Embassy, he gave a, a, a long assessment of the Franco-American uh, relationship. And one thing he said that I thought was kind of striking was uh, that he worried that the United States would start processing um, basically every relationship through uh, the lens of how it affects or does not affect the relationship with China. And he said he worried that this would have an impact on the transatlantic relationship, that if you start looking at every relationship uh, in terms of the rivalry with China, it could warp bilateral relations. Um, do, you, do you share that concern? Why don't I start with you, Minister Kekkonen? Well, I'm not sure am I the right man to explain what Macron <laughs> Macron French. No, no, you don't, said, not, you don't need to explain what he you said. You want a Finn to explain the French. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do come from the we same continent. We gave one thing to do. <laughs> continent. <laughs> but, um, well, uh, we know, of course, in, 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 in Europe the discussion here, and uh, it has been good that there has been political science from the US to, to Europe concerning, concerning China and, 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 and it's, it's a strong, strong role and uh, I think um, nations in Europe and European Union are more and more alert also for, for all of this and what would it mean. Uh, but, um, and we understand also those messages that Europe should stand on its own more and take more responsibility of its own defense and uh, I understand and I agree with that. But still we need this strong trans, uh, transatlantic bond between US and, 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 and Europe. But I think it's better that I don't try to explain more what Macron said <laughs> anyway. Well, Minister, you sort of referred to it, right, in saying it can't all be about Taiwan. It can't be about Taiwan. If, I, I think business will know how to respond to America placing front and center China as its strategic competitor for the next one or two decades. Businesses in Asia have already responded. They have now adopted the China Plus strategy. So anything they build, they build in China because it's too big a market to ignore. They want to be close to market, but they'll have plus, whether it's plus one or plus two. And uh, other countries will benefit, whether it's Vietnam, Malaysia, or Thailand. It will mean that prices will go up because there's redundancy. It will add to inflationary pressures, but we can handle it if, you know, if, it's, if it's over a longer period. Uh, but I think President Macron's issue doesn't only apply to France. So if the US decides, for example, for Singapore, that it's going to evaluate our worth or our value to US, depending on also how much investments we place in China, then it becomes a very difficult world for all businesses. Um, uh, maybe since I'm nominally in business, um, the, the thing is that there's just, there's in, in philosophy of a kind of you have dynamics that are kind of auto poetic, meaning they self actualize. There's the, you're at, a lot of your questions are what should we ought to do, but in reality, American business has decoupled from, from China. And I would say the dynamic in this country 
is very much one of skepticism, and that is going to affect our policies. And I believe, right, or, you know, you can argue about what should happen, but what will happen is a decoupling. Now, again, I don't, I'm not saying that's what one should want, but if you look at the pressures on business, the pressures on military, the pressures on polity, Americans by and large support this. And then, again, in, in American business currently, five, six years ago, there was a lot of people, there were a lot of industries that thought they were going to export to China and America. I, there still are some, very few. And so that, that's just going to have a very different dynamic on the future. Um, and again, I would, I would disambiguate is and odd. I think that is what's going to happen. So let me, let me stay with you. Um, one of the notable phenomena in the, in the uh, aftermath of Russia's expanded war in, in Ukraine was the, uh, the flight of private sector business from Russia. Does that merely reflect the coercive power of sanctions, or is there something else happening here? Are choices, are different choices, value choices being made by the private sector? Well, again, you know, we of course didn't have to flee Russia; we were never there. So, um, but uh, so I think honestly, I think good moral choices lead to good business choices. But I think what really is going to hurt uh, Russia over the long haul is just there's, in my business, you need the best of the best of the best of the best. And they do not want to work in a country that is invading their neighbor and committing atro atrocities. And it's not, the, the, the GDP in, in, in Russia is just not one that most international businesses are particularly focused on. That's different than China, obviously. Uh, although I'd say that's more European businesses. What, what will really mess up your ability to build complicated technical systems is an, an inability to explain to people what, what, what is good about my country. And again, it doesn't have to, and so, and I think that's why people fled, and I don't think they're going to go back very quickly. Um, and and that, that, that's, it's not actually about the capital market, it's about the moral market. Is, is it especially incumbent on America's high-tech partners to make a choice about where, where they're doing business? Um, we, high I, I think it is an indisputable fact that there are certain things, software platforms, that are, are disruptive in America is the focal point of building. And there are other countries, Israel is quite strong. Uh, there's some strong companies in France. Um, it is absolutely essential that we make decisions that are long-term in, in unison with the countries that allowed us to grow. In this case, for most of us, the US, United States of America. And I don't think it's, it, we should be allowed to just say, oh, we got rich here. Uh, we, we are the wealthiest, most, it, powerful people and industry in the world, but we don't support the US, United States of America. And why? Because you see in the Ukraine, and you will see in other places, that the, the products we build actually sway the world to our direction. Not as a matter of theory, not as a matter of rhetoric, but a matter of fact. And, um, and that's, that's, that's why I think we have a higher level of responsibility. Minister Ng, did you want to chime in? I wanted to respond to Alex Karp's point about businesses in the U.S. have already uncoupled from China. Uh, I'm not sure that's completely true, but even if it's true, I think the question that to be asked is that the optimum position for U.S.? China is a huge market. Uh, it's now 17 trillion of global economy trade, number two to U.S. And the question for, I think, U.S. as well, access to, access to markets. You're quite right. I mean, the experience in the last decade or two hasn't been all positive. There were issues about IP, issues about restrictions. But I think to the business sector, the question is, can you ignore China? And can you meet America's domestic goals, which ultimately is to lift your middle class? And I think part of the reaction against the TPP, uh, Lindsay, was the fact that median incomes in the U.S. have not risen for a good part of 10, 15 years. And where is that sweet spot? And can you afford to ignore China? Would India provide that market access with ASEAN, with other countries? And I would think that China is just too big to ignore as a market. A reminder, you can submit some questions through the app. Uh, I've got a question here. Do any of you have concerns about a potential conflict or competition between U.S. obligations to NATO allies and U.S. commitments to Indo-Pacific partners? Uh, Senator, when I 
steer that to you, but others can chime in as they will. Well, I mean, number one, after Afghanistan, everybody in Asia is wondering, should we join up with you? You know, I just got back from going to the region. If you don't think Afghanistan shook the world regarding us, you're crazy. So how do you reset Ukraine? If we can stick it out, make NATO stronger, uh, hold Putin accountable in the ICC and other venues, Ukraine is still standing. We get NATO to prove its worth to the American taxpayer. We're not having to do all this by ourselves. Then we really got a chance here to prove to the American taxpayer that alliances are a good thing. So if we get it right in Ukraine, it makes it easier for a guy like me to go and talk about what can we do to contain China. Yeah, I want to do business in China, but not this way. You know, Apple, you know, basically gave in to the airdrop thing. You know, it's hard for us, Mr. Minister, to ignore what's going on in China with their human rights abuses. Yeah, you I know it's a, it's a big market, but we've got to live in the world that we live in. So I just want to put a plug in for alliances. The only thing worse than an alliance is not having one. In Asia, I'd like to have a more economic alliance than we have today. In Asia, I'd like to have a military footprint bigger that doesn't so dependent on uh, Guam. In NATO, I'd like Finland and Sweden to come in sooner rather than later to let Putin know that your efforts to destroy our resolve backfired on you. Let me in with this. We haven't said a word about Iran. This entire conference, I haven't heard Iran mentioned once in any meaningful way. If you ask me what keeps me up at night, it's not so much China, it's not even Russia. It's the breakout of the Iranian regime on the nuclear front. If they ever acquire nuclear capability, every Arab, Sunni Arab nation is going to want a weapon of their own. And next thing you know, you're in a nuclear arms race in the Mideast. Do we have an alliance to contain Iran that's effective? No, we don't. So what would I like to see happen? We don't have a formal defense agreement with <laughs> Israel. Believe it or not, we don't. I'd like to work with the Biden administration to have a mutual defense agreement with the state of Israel letting Iran know that if you try to destroy the one and only Jewish state, you've got to come through us. I'd like to have a better relationship with the GCC. I'd like to give uh, 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 NATO status like, what's the, what's the term? Major non-NATO Major non ally status to the GCC. I'd like to pull them in our orbit. We got tons of problems with Saudi Arabia. They don't wear the democracy shirt, but they're important. So it's just not the shirt you wear. I'd like to accelerate reform in Saudi Arabia, but I'd like to form an alliance between the Arabs and the Israelis and the United States that makes it less likely there's going to be a breakout in Iran. That means we're going to have to show up in places. We're going to have to deal with people we don't like. I'll end with this. On the developmental aid side, where you can affect behavior without having the threat of military force, our country is in a world of hurt. We're giving Africa almost wholly to China because we're not showing up. And all things being equal, the African people would rather do business with us for a variety of reasons. So this whole topic of alliances is really important to me. Our budgets are not consistent with having deterrence we need militarily. Our infrastructure on the developmental late side is almost non-existent compared to China. But here's the good news. After Ukraine, after Russia invaded Ukraine, and it's been so brutal, there's a wake-up call here in the world. And we've got a chance to reset the world for the better. And that means we've got to beat Putin in Ukraine. General, I think I'm giving you the last word here. You manage a pretty bewildering uh, array of challenges. When you sit down with your partners across your area of responsibility, what do they want to talk about? So obviously, uh, when I come there as a general officer uh, uh, in the military, and uh, we speak about their security, the internal challenges that they're having, the ability to secure their country, secure their borders, being able to do that. I would say in this region, we have a call to action now between democracy and autocracy. I talked about before that these democracies are struggling to deliver for their people. We see it in the outcomes of critical elections that have happened with Chile, Colombia, Brazil. 
And uh, so now, uh, now it's an opportunity. I have to look at it that way. I can't look at it any other way. I've, I've got a clean slate, and we've got to make a difference and show what uh, alliances can bring and what our partnerships can bring. Uh, I've been to Columbia twice now with the new administration. I've been able to meet with the new president twice. We had just had the U United States Navy ship Comfort there for a week, treated over 5,000 uh, patients there in the two medical sites, did close to 100 surgeries, and then impacted with all the other wraparound activities, 35,000 Colombians in Cartagena, uh, Colombia. Now it's in Dominican Republic doing the same thing. So the soft power is really, really important. But again, um, we've got to be able to, uh, these are like-minded countries that think like us, but we have an opportunity and a window, uh, but it's ours to lose on these democracies in the Western Hemisphere. And we've got a lot of work to do in, in terms of uh, the national security, the security for them, and helping our partner nations. They absolutely want to work with us, and they want to work as part of team democracy. But again, it's ours to lose. All right, General Richardson, Minister Ng, Dr. Karp, Minister Kaikunen, and Senator Graham, thank you all very, very much. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.